coming up, we found Philae. Rockets successfully launch. Virgin Galactic flies again. And I talk with AJ Piplica, the Chief Operating Officer of Generation Orbit. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. Hello and welcome to tomorrow, episode 9.28. Very glad to have you here for September 10th, 2016. Now let's go ahead and get started by looking at our Patreon people. These are our tomorrow Patreon premiere members. These folks have given us $10 or more per episode that we do of this show. Now, these folks get access to everything that you can imagine. They get access to our Slack channel, early access to the show, and after dark, immediately occurring after the end of the show. They get everything that you can imagine. And if you would like to help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow, please consider going on over to patreon.com slash t M R O. Now, boy, are we busy here in the studio today because not only have you got me, Jared Head, you've also got our space pod correspondent from Down Under finally here in California today. Lisa, very glad to have you here. We've also got Space Mike over there from the mythical lands of Arizona. Uh, and then on the end of the table, we've got the lovely, the talented, the beautiful, the not my wife, Carrie Ann. So we're all very, very excited to be here today, especially because you're here, Lisa. You've you've made the long and arduous journey to be here today. I made the 18-hour plane ride to yeah. be here today. Oh my gosh, so that's, I don't even want to think about having to sit in a seat for 18 hours. So, <laughs> instead of thinking about that, let's go ahead and get this show started. And of course, Mike, we always started off with a launch, so please take us away. That's right. Well, we had a couple launches last week, and the first one we wanted to talk about was an Indian launch launching their geosynchronous satellite launch vehicle, Mark II, on Thursday, September 8th. Let's check out the launch footage. Two, four, three, two, one, L40 ignited. Yes. L40 performance normal and S130 ignition make a lift off from the launch pad. This was the first flight of the GSLV Mark II for 2016, and the GSLV rocket is a kind of a unique rocket. Uh, the core stage of the first stage is actually a solid rocket motor, and the side boosters are actually liquid-fueled rockets, and it's, it's very interesting. Like I said, this was the first flight for 2016 and the 10th flight overall of the GSLV between the Mark I and Mark II versions. Now, the, besides the, the with this, the whole thing with this is, is with this special launch is that it had the first operational flight of India's own cryogenic upper stage. And with their cryogenic upper stage, it's actually the fourth time that they've ever flown it. But the first time that they tried to, to fly their own cryogenic upper stage, it ended in failure back in 2001. And the Mark I vehicle was using Russian-made upper stages for a while with varying levels of of success and failure. But with this, they are going to be using, from the Mark II version on, their own cryogenic upper stage. And the reason that this, they're considering this the first operational flight of this is that all the previous, the, the last two flights that were successful with their cryogenic upper stage were considered test flights and had additional objectives during the flight. But this particular flight was the first time where uh, ISRO, the Indian Space Research Organization, was solely focused on delivering the payload. And the payload for this launch was the INSAT 3DR weather observation satellite. The INSAT uh, 3DR spacecraft is actually a replacement for India's previous INSAT 3D spacecraft. And it will be observing the atmosphere over land and sea, as well as aid in search and rescue operations and disaster relief. This is going to be providing services over India, as well as parts of the Middle East and even parts of uh, Eastern Africa. So very cool that they're going to be able to have this uh, service up and running, and uh, uh, they're going to be having even more launches for the rest of the year. And, and I'm very happy that they're able to have a fully operational GSLV Mark II. And something else that's interesting about this is with the operational cryogenic upper stage, their next big rocket, which is the GSLV Mark III. And even though it's in the same family, it's it's a very different vehicle from uh, the Mark I and Mark II versions. Now that they have the, the data that they need from this 
version of a cryogenic upper stage, they can move forward with creating the upper stage for that larger GSLV Mark III rocket and hopefully begin uh, operational flights of that very soon. So congratulations to everyone over at ISRO for this successful launch. Yeah, nothing quite like a homegrown rocket uh, finally reaching its stride. So that is just some fantastic uh, stuff to see from India. The funny thing about the Absolutely. ISRO launches that I, I always, uh, it always throws me off a little bit, is the plus one, plus two, plus yeah. three, which Hans <laughs> no in the lip. chat room says that he absolutely loves. Uh, I like it too. But it, it throws me off. I always feel like there's something wrong. Like, okay, let's oh. go. Yeah. <laughs> What's taking so long? Like, I always feel like there's something wrong there. But yeah, because we're accustomed to hearing it during like engineering flights and things like yeah. that, like test flights, not like actual flights of the vehicle. So, uh, but still, that's a, no. A, I mean, it's it's great. It's Don't another get me wrong. it's another cool thing that shows the the subtle differences between each country's space program. Totally. So it's some really yeah, cool stuff. We're so used to hearing the three, two, one liftoff and inspirational yeah. yeah. paragraph. And then said plus you know? one, plus two. Yeah. I think it would really so. be as noticeable. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Very very cool. <laughs> well, speaking of uh, a very interesting thing happening in space, Lisa, they've done something on the International Space Station that's never been done before. They have. They have sequenced DNA in space. So um, American astronaut Kate Rubens, she's on station right now, and she has sequenced DNA. And she did that using a really, really tiny DNA sequencer. It's about the size of a Snickers bar, so it's really small. Usually DNA sequences are about the size of a microwave, if not bigger and the cool thing about that is that she was able to sequence mouse bacterial and viral DNA and that's cool because Three, that can be sequenced two, really really one. quickly because it plugs into a USB port of a laptop on the space station and the cool reason for doing that is if we know the DNA sequence of a uh, sample in space then you can use that to diagnose an astronaut if they're sick so you can find out what bacteria is making them sick so you know which antibiotics that you can give them. And you can also, if there's an experiment on station where you need to know um, the results of your experiment in real time, you can do that on station without having to wait to, say, put your sample back into a dragon and bring it back down to Earth and then wait for that to be transported to your lab and then do the sequencing so you're saving time. But the really cool thing is that they want to use this mini ion. It, that's the name of the of the technology and they want to use that to maybe go and search for life on other planets because it's so small it doesn't weigh a lot and it can be plugged into a, a laptop so if they're able to do that they could test samples on for example Mars and use that to see if there's life on Mars with something as simple as the size of a Snickers bar. Wow that is awesome. That's very interesting. And That's you know, really cool it reminds me of like the what was the Star Trek like uh, Tricorder? Thank you. It, yeah, yeah it reminds thing. me a little bit of that, of like, oh, no, this is what's wrong. There you go. Yeah. Oh. Totally handheld device. <laughs> Super simple. Very, very nice. Well, thank you, That's Lisa. Awesome. That was uh, really, really cool. And speaking of the search for the makeup of life, Space Mike, we've got a launch that happened this week, which actually may help bring us clues as to why life may be here on Earth. That's right. The OSIRIS-REx mission, which is the asteroid sample uh, return mission, uh, which is one of NASA's New Frontiers mission, began its seven-year round-trip journey to take a sample from an asteroid, asteroid Bennu, and return it to Earth. And uh, this launch also occurred on Thursday, the same day as uh, the uh, Indian GSLV launch. And this was a United Launch Alliance Atlas V that delivered the uh, OSIRIS-REx. Let's check out the launch footage for that. Three, two, one. And liftoff of Osiris Rex, its seven year mission to boldly go to the asteroid Bennu and back. Pirates look good. Part of the pump speeds and general pressures are within family. Speed chamber pressures have plateaued, begun to ramp off. This launch took place on Thursday, September 8th at 23.05 Coordinated Universal Time from Space Launch Complex 41 at Cape Canaveral, Florida. This was the launch complex that was right next door to SpaceX's SLC-40 and didn't suffer any damage from that. Now, this Atlas V version is the 411 configuration. It's rarely used. You can see a great shot there. It only has one solid rocket booster on the side of it. And the whole 411 thing is for a four-meter payload fairing, the one solid rocket booster, 
and a single engine Centaur upper stage. And uh, with two engine burns, uh, the, the upper stage of this, the Centaur upper stage, delivered the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft into a uh, Earth departure velocity and entered into a heliocentric orbit, or rather in orbit around the sun instead of around the Earth's sphere of influence. Now, the spacecraft will perform an Earth flyby next year to get a gravity assist in order to rendezvous with uh, Bennu uh, with less uh, needs to use its own propellant, but it will be using its own propellant for several different correction maneuvers. And uh, the ho hopefully it will be uh, arriving at Bennu in 2018 if uh, all the maneuvers to rendezvous with it are done correctly. And uh, once there, OSIRIS-REx will spend two years at asteroid Bennu. And it's the asteroid Bennu is a relatively slow spinning asteroid, which makes it a really ideal candidate for sample collection. And the really cool thing about this is that if it's successful, um, they will be able to return to Earth, hopefully in 2023. And a return capsule on the spacecraft will return to Earth, and OSIRIS-REx will go back into a solar orbit. And personally, I hope that NASA is able to have a use for OSIRIS and have some sort of extended mission after the asteroid sample has returned to Earth. And uh, uh, with this launch, the entire launch was successful, and uh, the spacecraft is healthy. And hopefully this seven-year journey was going to be entirely successful. And congratulations to United Launch Alliance for this successful launch. And good luck to NASA for uh, not only keeping this mission a little bit under budget, but uh, doing this in a timely manner as well. So good news all around. Yes, and as, as our chat room was pointing out to us, uh, this was launched on the 50th anniversary of Star Trek, the original series being aired for the first time. So uh, go figure uh, that, you know, yeah. 50 years after that, we are boldly going to something a little bit bigger than the Empire State Building. So very, very cool with that there. So speaking of these, these little things that we have orbiting around the sun, <laughs> uh, guess what happened? We found Philae. Yay. So everybody probably remembers Philae, which was a part of the European Space Agency's Rosetta mission. It's basically a, uh, I guess for lack of better size comparison, a uh, drier sized space probe that was dropped from Rosetta to the surface of the comet that it's orbiting, Churyumov Gerasimenko, or 67P, whichever you prefer. Um, unfortunately, as you can see with the animation using actual data here, um, the systems that were supposed to keep Philae uh, attached to the surface of the comet failed to activate, and it kind of, you know, went off spinning. Um, and it ended up floating and flying around uh, all over uh, the surface of the comet. Now, they did not, um, they, they kept in contact with it for three days before its batteries ran out of power. They were hoping that it could go longer um, because it does, does have solar panels on board, but it eventually died um, simply because it landed in a crevice and it was shaded and it was basically like everything that you could imagine going wrong with it kind of did go wrong. Um, so unfortunately, it only worked for three days. They did get in touch with it again back in June and July of 2015, but it was basically just pings from Philae saying, hey, I'm on, um, not really any data that was useful, but Philae still did accomplish all of its scientific goals. So what they were doing is they were hunting for Philae with the cameras that are on board of Rosetta because they sort of had an idea of where Philae should have been but they didn't really know where Philae was simply because it's really difficult to try to find a gray space probe on the surface of a gray comet. <laughs> so uh, You so, don't say. Yeah, it turns out really difficult. Um, so <laughs> one of the things that they did is they took extremely high resolution imagery of the surface and they tried to see where it would have been and lo and behold, just earlier this week, guess what they did? They found it. Yay. So there, there's the little Philae sitting uh, sort of on its side on the surface of the comet there. It was pretty easy to find because it turns out there was a red box right around it. Uh, no, I'm just kidding about that. But uh, as you can see here, we've got this sort of uh, overall huge area on that one end of the comet there. And then we've got a, a wide shot for context of where Philae is and then a close-up image of Philae right there. And that was found on September 2nd. Uh, and this image was taken 2.7 kilometers above the surface to find Philae in its final resting place. And you can see it's tipped over on its side and uh, overall not exactly how you want your lander to be on the surface um, if you can. And they were even able to determine 
asked what instruments uh, were pointed in what direction so they could figure out the orientation of Philae. So that was a, a very, very cool thing that they were able to do. Now Rosetta will be landing on the surface of the comet on September 30th. They're going to attempt to land it. Rosetta was not designed to land on the surface of the comet, so we'll see what happens. I'm pretty excited. Uh, they're going to be doing that later this month, so uh, pretty cool stuff. So, Lisa, there's something very interesting happening not too far from us at the Studio of Tomorrow. Here. A little bit closer to home. Yes, quite a bit. So, <laughs> Virgin Galactic have had a captive carry test flight of their spaceship to spacecraft. So you guys might remember that back in 2014, October 31st, 2014 to be specific, the VSS Enterprise was lost in an accident. But the new Spaceship 2 spacecraft, the VSS Unity, performed a captive carry test flight on September 8th. And because it's a captive carry test flight, that meant that the Spaceship 2 was never detached from its carrier aircraft, the White Knight 2. So it was attached the whole time through launch, the testing, and the landing. They reached an altitude of 12 kilometers, and for you guys that still use Imperial, that's 50,000 feet. <laughs> <laughs> because some people still use Imperial. But the test flight lasted for three hours and 43 minutes, and it allowed them to test their flight operation procedures and other things like testing the airflow around the spacecraft while, while it's still uh, flying um, underneath its carrier craft. It was piloted, the uh, Spaceship 2 spacecraft was piloted by Mark Stuckey and Dave McKay. And White Knight 2 was piloted by Mike Masuki and Todd Erickson with flight engineer Wes Pasal. So now that they've done this successful carrier flight, the next step is to analyze all the data from all the different sensors and stuff that they had flying on those two um, airships uh, for the test. They also want to look at how their procedures were going, but most of all, they want to make sure that everything is fine so that eventually they could maybe do another carrier flight and then move on to free flight and then finally, maybe in six months or more, move on to carrying passengers. So Virgin Galactic are doing great things. Yes, I'm glad to have them back too. Yeah. So it's, yeah. I mean, you know, as we like to think, say here at uh, Tomorrow, uh, all ships rise with the tide. Yeah. So it's, it's good that we're getting um, a lot of people back into suborbital space flight and yeah. we're, we're very glad to have them back. All right, so I want to talk about up in orbit a little bit here with a spacecraft known as Sentinel-1A from the European Space Agency. Um, this is a story that I've been wanting to talk about for a couple weeks, but we've been a little too busy to talk about it, so might as well talk about it now, which is that the probe appears to have been impacted by something while it was in orbit around the Earth. Um, now, this is an animation of Sentinel-1A being launched back in 2014. And uh, the ground controllers kind of noticed something um, interesting that happened while it was on orbit, which is that there was a dip in power generation from Sentinel-1 solar arrays at, at uh, 17.07 Coordinated Universal Time on August 23rd. They also noticed that there was a small change in its orbit, which is about 700 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. And they also noticed that there was a small change in the orientation of the vehicle. So its attitude was different than where it should have been at. And now this is a radar satellite, so it has to be pointed down at the Earth for a very specific reason. So um, it's very, very important for it, its orientation to be set correctly. So they were very confused as to what happened. Now, back in 2014, what is so cool about this spacecraft is that they have two cameras on board that were basically there, with which only their, their only job for these cameras to do was to take images of the solar arrays to make sure that they had been deployed correctly. So that's, that's all that they did. So the engineers said, well, we've noticed that there's been a loss of power from one of our solar arrays in the amount that it gives us. Let's just go ahead and turn on those cameras and see if there's anything different. So they turned on the cameras, they took images, and lo and behold, they found a damaged area in the solar panel about 40 centimeters across. And you can see that image on your left there is right after solar array deployment back in 2014. And then the one on the right there is the image with the red arrow pointing at the damage there. Now, engineers are analyzing the trajectory to see 
if this impactor was either a micrometeoroid, so something from outside of the influence of the Earth, or if Sentinel-1A actually got hit by a piece of space junk. So, um, but they estimate the size of the impactor was about five millimeters. So uh, very, very small. Uh, for those of you who are a little more imperially inclined, that's about a fifth of an inch. So uh, that's really, really small. But of course, when you're in space, you got to move really, really fast. So even things five millimeters in size have a tremendous amount of energy. Now this is not going to affect Sentinel-1A. It's perfectly fine. It's going to be um, uh, still operational and everything's going to work uh, per excellent for it. And it's, it's okay. Yeah. It's just that, you know, it got hit by something while it was on orbit. And this is a really rare thing because this hasn't happened too much. So this is uh, potentially going to allow us to study what happens to vehicles when they're on orbit and they get hit by a piece of something, whatever it may have been. So uh, we'll stay tuned for more news on that one. Even though it's, really it's not damaged. Go ahead, Lisa, sorry. Sorry, Mike. Even though if, no, go ahead. if it had have been damaged, because it's Sentinel-1A, I believe with these Sentinel satellites, they come in pairs, so there's a 1A yes. and a 1B. Uh -huh. So even if 1A was damaged, the way that they've designed that mission is that 1B could have taken over the job. So. Exactly, yeah. It was, just, it was just very convenient for them to have two satellites getting double the data yeah. uh, over half the time with the Earth. So, yeah, so that's a really good point, which is that they do have Sentinel-1B there to help them out. So. Yeah. And Mike, and, you had and it's something? It's really a testament. Yeah, it was really a testament to how well the uh, spacecraft was designed, considering the potential for how much energy and speed could have been involved with this, you know, potential impact. We're not even sure exactly what, uh, uh, what, what caused this damage, but that the solar panels, if it was an impact, didn't shatter and, and didn't, you know, uh, disable the spacecraft completely. It just has a dip in power, you know, by shutting off, you know, certain instruments or, or you know, having uh, power, um, you know, uh, rationing, I guess, and having certain instruments on at certain times and stuff, the spacecraft is can still be fully operational. So that's just really amazing to me that even if there was, you know, a, a really bad impact like that, that, that the rest of the solar panel is still working. You know, it's just a dip in power from that side. So that's that's really cool to me. Yeah, and the uh, the chat room is asking us if the hull of a U.S. or Russian space station has ever been punctured due to space debris, and it hasn't. Um, there have been impacts, um, like one of the most well-known one was on one of the early shuttle missions. Something actually like hit one of the cockpit windows and like shattered a, a really big part of it. Um, so, which I'm sure that was really fun to look at throughout the Can mission. Can only imagine. Um, also, I know the cupola on the International Space Station has some micrometeoroid damage to it as well that they've noticed. Um, and uh, one of the one oh. of the solar panels on the ISS as well had a large puncture hole a couple of years back. I yes. can't remember the, all the details now, but yes, that's true as well. Um, and then also in uh, 2009, a iridium uh, communication satellite and a Russian, an old dead Russian Cosmos satellite, actually directly collided, and it was the first uh, first, I guess you would call it, energetic kinetic collision, accidentally performed by two spacecraft. Um, <laughs> that led to a lot orbit. of lot of debris. Yeah, the, yeah. The closing velocity of that was something like 15 kilometers per second. It was just ridiculous. So, um, yeah. So, yeah. There's there's a lot of stuff up there, um, and hopefully they'll be cleaning it up uh, sooner rather than later. So I believe that's it for our news today. So what we are going to do now is we are going to go to a break, and when we come back, we are going to have Ben interviewing AJ Piplica, the COO of Generation Orbit. This is going to be a pretty interesting one um, because these guys are developing small sat launchers and we are going to listen in and it's going to be pretty darn good. So we'll see you right after this break. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, Help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. 
not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know our journey didn't end. We've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get started with our interview segment, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. And we've also got our Tomorrow producers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. To find out how you can help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, this is going to be an exciting one. We were talking before the show about how we're having Generation Orbit on, and um, not a whole lot of people, even in the Tomorrow Studios, really know who Generation Orbit is. So we've got A.J. Piplica, the COO, the Chief Operating Officer of Generation Orbit. A.J., welcome to Tomorrow. Hey, Ben. Thanks for having me on. So um, who is Generation Orbit? What are you guys doing? So we're building small air launch systems for small payloads. Um, right now, we're working primarily on a vehicle called Go Launcher 1. Um, it's a single-stage liquid rocket that's launched from a Gulfstream 3 aircraft, um, and it's primarily designed for hypersonic flight testing. Um, we're also operating a small uh, Learjet um, with uh, a pod underneath the wing uh, that we call the Go Flight Experiment Testbed, and we utilize this for some uh, testing of uh, air launch subsystems as well as a platform for STEM education. So every flight that we have um, of the, uh, the Go FET, uh, we like to have a, a student group uh, basically put together a small CubeSat that they fly uh, and, and operate as though it were in flight. So you guys have been around for a little while now. Uh, how did you guys get started doing some of these small sats and small launchers? Sure. So, uh, yeah, Go has been around for about five years. Um, we're a subsidiary of Spaceworks Enterprises. Um, you may be familiar with Spaceworks um, as the company that uh, puts together a small sat market forecast every year. Um, so as you can imagine, we had a our eye on the small sat launch market for quite some time, even before we started the company. Um, but we saw a real opportunity to put together um, the kind of two skill sets, one being uh, knowledge of the small sat launch market and then the other being uh, experience in a number of air launch systems uh, over the past maybe 15 years or so. Um, so we saw a real niche where we thought air launch um, could be a really good, uh, good application uh, for overall small sat launch vehicles. Yeah, I think that the key thing here is you're doing this today, right? So the Go Flight Experiments, uh, the GoFET, is is launching right now today. So if I wanted to send something up on that today, I could. Yeah, absolutely. So we've flown it uh, three times. Uh, most recent flight was in December of last year. Um, and uh, yeah, we do that for commercial customers as well as uh, some of our own uh, internal R&D efforts. And then um, again, with uh, bringing in students uh, as much as we can as well. And then moving forward, you've got additional plans ab above and beyond the Go Flight Experiments testbed. You've also got, like you mentioned, Go Launcher One. What what does mm -hmm. Go Launcher One look like? How is it different than what you've got today? Sure. So Go One, uh, it will be the first uh, actual vehicle that we've designed and built in house uh, that we're flying. Uh, the Go Fet is a is an old uh, electronic countermeasures pod that we've basically gutted the internals of. Uh, but Go One will be our first rocket system, um, and we'll be using it to fly uh, in the atmosphere at uh, Mach numbers up to about six or eight. So um, we're flying a rocket the way you would normally fly a scramjet, um, and the reason for that is because we don't have very many operating scramjet vehicles to uh, fly in these kinds of flight conditions. So, you know, this is I kind of liken it back to what X-15 did uh, back in the 50s, um, using a, a rocket vehicle as a test bed for. Uh, hypersonics technology. So primarily focused on um, yeah, flying high Mach number, high dynamic pressure uh, flight conditions. And both of these are air launch systems. And in the chat room, uh, someone basically asked, what's the advantage of doing an air launch as opposed to a ground launch? Sure. So you get a couple of things. Um, one, 
obviously flexible basing. So uh, you can take your, if it's designed correctly, you can take your entire launch uh, infrastructure um, out to any licensed spaceport around the globe. Um, and that's helpful uh, whether you're flying a suborbital mission or even orbital, um, getting into different launch azimuths and so forth. Um, obviously, there's a performance advantage um, in launching above much of the appreciable atmosphere. Um, so you can put a larger expansion ratio uh, on your booster engine, so you get a little high performance ISP and thrust uh, from that vehicle or from that system. Um, and uh, I think at a small scale, um, when we're talking about rockets that weigh you know less than ten thousand pounds or so, um, there's there's a wide range of aircraft that uh, that can carry those kinds of weights. So um, you know we have uh, a number of Gulfstream threes that uh, are available to us uh, to go fly the kinds of missions that we need to do today. And you kind of just, you, you glossed over it pretty quickly, but, you know, <laughs> one of the advantages is, of course, um, you're higher up in the atmosphere, and so uh, you're, you're essentially a two-stage launch system. You t look at a traditional rocket, it's stages, and the engine on the second stage is actually designed slightly differently than the sea level engines to uh, mm -hmm. uh, compensate for the lack of um, uh, pressure and atmosphere. Uh, but you don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to have an entire rocket engine on the first stage. You're using the airplane to get to that point. Yep, exactly. So, um, yeah, you can certainly consider uh, the aircraft as the first stage or stage zero uh, of the system. So, you know, turbine-based, um, we take the aircraft up to uh, 35 to 40,000 feet, uh, and then we do a launch maneuver where uh, we bring the flight path angle on the system up to about 35 or 40 degrees uh, and then release the rocket. So it's actually at uh, about 40 degrees uh, of flight path angle when, uh, when the vehicle is released. And that's actually a big driver, especially when um, you're looking at delta V's to orbit uh, that initial flight path angle because uh, ideally wants to be somewhere up around 55 or 60 degrees, um, but as much as you can get uh, really helps you. To, you don't have to turn as much with the rocket. So Pegasus, for example, uh, launched pretty close to zero, so you'll see a, a pretty pretty steep pull up that the vehicle has to do. So using the aircraft for as much as we can, we have big wings, we use them. Uh, so talking about delta V for a moment or the change in velocity, um, uh, Neuropilot asks, what's the delta V benefit of a larger Gulfstream subsonic versus a supersonic MiG-21? Oh, well, uh, I don't know if I have the numbers off the top of my head, um, <laughs> but uh, you, you do end up launching at a higher dynamic pressure generally um, as you go supersonic. Uh, so the drag losses uh, can be increased uh, even though you're starting at a higher velocity. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I don't know if I have a number off the top of my head, but um, yeah, it should be a minimal benefit. A uh, couple more questions from the chat room. Uh, Lance asks, what kind of cargo mass can you do and to what orbits? Okay, so uh, Go Launcher 1 is, is just a single stage suborbital vehicle, so it doesn't actually go to orbit, but it's designed for payloads of 300 to 1,000 pounds. Um, the future orbital systems that we're looking at, uh, there's a number of them. Uh, Go2 has been uh, in our roadmap for quite some time, and that was sized for uh, about 45 kilograms or 100 pounds to low Earth orbit. And then what kind of orbital planes can you do? Is it just pure low Earth orbit? Could you do any sort of polar launches? Uh, what can you yeah, do Yeah, so that? that's yeah one of the flexibilities of, uh, of air launches that uh, you can hit almost any azimuth, um, both from the East Coast or the West Coast. Hawaii is actually a very interesting place to launch from because um, you can go pretty much any direction pretty close to the equator. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, we don't have to go build up launch sites uh, in different parts of the globe to get to different inclinations, which is helpful. And you, you mentioned, I think you had six flights already. Those weren't just test flights. You've actually, your Space Vogel is asking, have you actually launched payload thus far? Oh, uh, no, no, nothing yet. So the first uh, rocket powered flights uh, of the Go 1 will be. Uh, about toward the end of next year, early 2018. So we've got still a good deal of uh, development to do. Um, we are in the process of a couple uh, ground demonstration programs right now. Um, so about around this time next year, we will have completed uh, a ground demonstration of the fully integrated stage. Um, we will have also completed uh, captive carry and release flight testing of uh, a mock-up test article. So it matches the mass properties and, and aerodynamic properties. Um, and then we'll put those two together. Um, and fly the real vehicle toward the end of next year. Now that's go one, but the uh, flight mm -hmm. experiments test bed, that has flown customers or oh. has that only been? It has. Yep, yep, yeah. So we've had three of those. Uh, we just don't, it's, it's just a fully captive uh, test bed. It doesn't launch anything from the aircraft. And, and where do you go from here? Is, is, are you eventually going to do a suborbital and orbital air launch systems or is that, what's your kind of path forward from after go one? Yeah, so there's a couple of different paths that we can take. Obviously, we're keeping a close eye on the small sat market. Um, it's going to be very interesting to see how that develops, both on the supply and demand side, in the coming years. 
Um, I think we're going to be in a good spot to uh, join the fight there. Uh, once Go 1 is complete, we have a number of designs uh, ready to go for larger air launch systems um, that you'll see uh, on our website. Um, but then, you know, with, with Go 1 being a hypersonic platform, um, we're also going to be in a unique position to push the boundaries of atmospheric flight. Um, so we're very interested in uh, looking at high-speed point-to-point transportation of cargo uh, and people. Um, once uh, once we uh, kind of develop the technology that we need to get there, so um, I think you know come come around 2018, uh, I think you'll see uh, both uh, orbital and uh, high-speed point-to-point uh, vehicles in our future. Is this is this an example? I think this is the Go Next vehicle. Is that even mm-hmm. further in the future? No, that's that's what a uh, one option for uh, what a high-speed point-to-point vehicle would look like. Um, this one uh, uses a combined cycle uh, propulsion system, so it uses uh, turbines uh, as well as uh, scramjet propulsion uh, to basically cruise uh, Mach six or so um, to uh, fly in the atmosphere. Um, altitudes range, you know, from uh, 90, 90 to one hundred thousand feet or so. Uh, Trebles asks, why not use like a quadcopter or air balloon? Just go up as really high as you can and then release the rocket. Sure. So uh, what you don't get with um, with a balloon launch uh, is uh, velocity or flight path angle. So you get a good deal of altitude. Um, you also can't uh, control the um, the launch point as well uh, as you can with an aircraft. You can you can pretty much hit uh, a small box or window that you need to be in without uh, being able to kind of uh, just you know, get rid of disturbances from wind and turbulence and so forth. That you, it's a little bit more difficult to do with a balloon. Uh, quadcopters, I think, you're pretty limited in terms of the altitude that you can hit with those. Uh, Dada, if we go back to the image of the Go Launcher One, uh, you, you can actually see it sitting underneath the the wing. Uh, there's only one underneath the wing, and um, uh, someone asked in the chat room. I, I apologize, I forgot. I've missed their name. Space Mike has asked, would you ever launch with one under each wing, or would you ever only launch one at a time? Okay, so this guy is the uh, is the Go uh, FET. So that one stays captive uh, all the time. The uh, the actual vehicles that we're flying are from a center line uh, hard point. So there's only one. Yeah, exactly, right there. Um, so uh, there's only one at a time. Um, there are other carrier aircraft options besides uh, the Gulfstreams that we're currently working towards, um, and it's certainly possible uh, for different applications to launch multiple vehicles from a single flight. Actually, we don't have the images uh, ready on, uh, at least for the show, but if you go to the website, you can look at them. But I- as you look at the images, basically each launcher gets bigger and bigger, as does the, uh, carry, ca- the carrying airplane itself. Uh, mm-hmm. is there, I assume that's just you know, size of payload changing, depending upon what you need. It will increase the size of the air- aircraft? Yeah, exactly. So with an air launch system, um, you have uh, an additional gross weight limit. So ground launch rockets have a gross weight limit that's based on uh, the thrust of the engines. So we have that as well. But we also have the carriage capacity of the aircraft to deal with. So um, as you want to grow the size of your rocket and grow the size of your payload to orbit, um, you need both more thrust and uh, the ability to carry more weight on an aircraft. I'm going to combine two questions from one person in the chat room from Trebles, which is, uh, which customers have shown the biggest interest? Is it government, military, education? And have you had uh, any interest from other countries as well? Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I think uh, all of those. So I think the, the primary interest from uh, for the Go-1 uh, has come from uh, the, the Air Force um, and NASA here in the States. Um, we've had some interest uh, from Japan and also some commercial interest in that vehicle uh, from a couple of different companies who are uh, looking at other hypersonic systems that they're developing. Um, for uh, the orbital systems, we've had interest from all over the world. Um, we had 10 letters, 10 letters of intent signed for Go2, uh, which is an orbital, the orbital system that we mentioned. That uh, I think half of those are, uh, are domestic and half of those are international. So we're seeing uh, a good deal of support from all over the world. Uh, Peter asks, looking into the future, are you going to have CubeSat to the moon capability, or are you kind of focusing really on low Earth orbit? Uh, it depends on what the customer wants to do. Um, if, uh, if we've got the Delta V to take their, uh, their particular payload mass uh, on a particular trajectory, we'd be happy to do it for them, whether it's uh, to the moon, to an asteroid, um, or anywhere else in the solar system, um, so assuming we have the, uh, the performance to hit the, the trajectories that they need. Uh, Destructor 1701 has an interesting question and a topic that comes up more often than we like here in the U.S., which is, uh, have you encountered any issues with ITAR, the International Trade and Arms Regulations? Um, do you anticipate any showstoppers, showstoppers from a regulation standpoint? 
No, uh, I mean, we, we deal with ITAR on a regular basis, um, just managing inf from an information management standpoint. Um, but as far as um, it being a hindrance to us, um, I, I, don't think, uh, I don't think we've had to deal with it in, in that regard. Um, all of our suppliers are domestic here in the U.S. Um, now, when it comes to operating an air launch system outside of the United States, um, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But, um, yeah, for the most part so far, everything's been fine. So now the big questions, uh, which boils down to money. Uh, uh, Tewicket asks, you have big plans. Do you also have the funding to support them? That's a big thing in new spaces. We all have a lot of really big ideas, but finding them, securing the money to actually execute on them is actually much harder than sometimes the idea itself. Absolutely. So, uh, you know, for us, it's important to have uh, a big vision. Uh, that's why we got into this business, and that's why most people do, I think. Um, but uh, we're also very realistic in terms of our, uh, you know, the goals that we set in the near term. Um, so the the steps that we've put forward on Go One are all funded, um, and uh, you know, like I said, the FET uh, is is operational and uh, can fly whenever we need it to. Um, so that's why, uh, you know, I'm not too uh, kind of uh, grandiose about um, the particular things that we have coming in the future because I mean, there there are a number of years down the road, um, and uh, the funding isn't there to back them up yet, but. Uh, we're very pleased with where we're going on Go One uh, right now. We have a number of milestones to hit in the next year. Um, we're ready to do it. And uh, yeah, now we just have to execute. So s similar on the financials, um, uh, Damon asks, how much does it cost? And now that was kind of an open-ended question, so I'm going to say, <laughs> if we wanted to fly a payload tomorrow, sure. how much would it cost for a different size payloads? Well, tomorrow and then sure, maybe so a year. <laughs> so the, the Go FET uh, tends to cost about 20 k a flight. Uh, so pretty low cost. Um, now that's, again, flying around in a captive carry pod underneath a Learjet. Um, but for uh, the kinds of things that we need to do, it works pretty well for us. Um, the Go 1, uh, the cost point there uh, is about $2 million per flight, um, which is about half of uh, kind of the current uh, next best system uh, that's available, available for accessing uh, these kinds of flight conditions that the Go 1 is capable of. So you're looking kind of at that small, there's a huge, we've talked a lot about this a lot, huge explosion in the small sat launcher market. Is that really where you're going to mm -hmm. be focusing? You talked a little bit about uh, cargo and possibly a crew in the future, but right now is that is that it? Is it the small sat uh, market that you're really trying to target? So for us with Go One, it's it's hypersonic flight test. Um, you know, CubeSat is, uh, so I think, something that's that's still, still growing um, and will come next for us once we get the Go One flying. Um, you know, for us, Go One is a is a pretty interesting business case on its own, but it also serves as a risk reduction platform for basically demonstrating the technologies that we need for larger air launch systems capable of getting to orbit, uh, whether it be cryogenic propellant management, um, overall operations, um, propulsion development, all those things we're able to work out with Go One um, and pave the way for uh, the next step. Uh, Interstellar asks where your launch site is, although, uh, you know, you're an air launch system, so your launch site's anywhere you have a runway, right? Potentially, potentially. So we do, uh, we do like to launch from places that have FAA launch licenses, or uh, excuse me, spaceport licenses. So uh, our baseline uh, base of operations will be Cecil Field, uh, or Cecil Spaceport down in Jacksonville, Florida. They've had their uh, FAA launch, or excuse me again. Uh, spaceport license for a number of years now. Um, so we actually flew uh, one of the Go FET flights out of uh, Cecil, uh, the first one. So it gave them a chance to essentially exercise some of their uh, launch procedures uh, on the ground and, and in the air. So scheduling airspace, um, running out all the uh, the safety equipment and so forth. So uh, it was a good opportunity to test uh, things that they've done on paper but never really done in real life. I bet Spaceport America is willing to give you a really good deal right now if you wanted to as well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, just a couple so. more here, a couple more questions before we uh, head back into break. Uh, one of it is uh, Heldas asks, what kind of customer base uh, did you identify when you're first building up the business plan versus what does the customer base actually look like now that you're actually starting to, mm -hmm. you, I know you're only doing captive carry stuff, but you know, as you're getting closer yep. to uh, go one. Sure. So uh, the customer base originally, um, I think you saw the first growth in small sats and cube sats for the most part coming out of uh, academia and government. Um, and uh, I think maybe three or four years ago, we really started to see a massive switch uh, to commercial customers, um, whether it be uh, Earth observation satellites, which I think have been uh, the real uh, kind of first uh, treaders uh, in terms of commercially viable small sat constellations, um, whether it's planet. Uh, or other companies doing uh, different types of Earth observation, not just remote sensing. Um, 
and then uh, I think you're going to see now going forward, uh, we've already started to see this a little bit as well, uh, is a transition, not so much a transition, but a growth toward uh, other segments of the small sat market, mainly for communications. So I think you're starting to see a lot more uh, IoT applications and uh, uh, in-space communications um, being, uh, being developed for uh, small sat uh, constellations and, and CubeSats in some cases. And then, of course, you have uh, the big SpaceX and OneWeb uh, Internet uh, constellations that are in development. So um, I think a lot of that has, has continued to drive uh, demand for uh, launch services across the spectrum of payload ranges from 5 kilograms up to you know, 150 or 200 or so. As you mentioned, you're designing Go1, and they're asking, uh, as you're designing that, are you designing the engines yourself? And if so, what fuels will we be using? Uh, that was from Lance. Sure, that's a great question. So the fuels are kerosene and liquid oxygen. Um, so uh, pretty standard uh, booster type fuels. Um, our engine is uh, being developed right now uh, at a small company in Denver called Ursa Major Technologies. A um, few, uh, few folks from Blue Origin uh, started that company a couple years ago. Uh, and they're developing uh, the first ox-rich stage combustion engine uh, in quite some time. Uh, it's called Hadley. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the engine for Go-1. It's about 5,000 pounds thrust. So it sounds like Go-1 is pretty far along in the, in the, in the chain at this point. Um, from there, we saw, you know, saw kind of Go-1, but then we also saw that space plane concept, the, uh, the Go-Next. Uh, again, that was just conceptual mm -hmm. drawing uh, of what it may look like. What are the steps to get from Go-1 to something like that space plane? Sure. So the first thing is learning to fly in the kinds of environments that are necessary to operate um, those types of high-speed point-to-point systems. And that means high Mach number, high dynamic pressure, so high Mach number in the atmosphere. Um, and demonstrating um, scramjet propulsion um, or dual-mode propulsion, whether it's ramjet, scramjet, um, and uh, also getting to those to the uh, to the Mach numbers where you can start operating those systems. Uh, there's obviously turbines and and rockets uh, as different ways to get there. So um, being able to demonstrate um, a fully integrated system that's capable of uh, you know going from New York to London in uh, minutes instead of hours. Um, that's that's really the next step for us after Go One is doing a small demo. I think. Um, that uh, encompasses the demonstration of technologies that's necessary to build uh, the commercially viable um, systems like that. It also looks awesome. The, the mock-up, it just it looks really <laughs> cool. It looks like the future on the screen, right? That was the future we were promised in oh, the yeah. 60s and 70s. It's, it, it's really awesome looking. Uh, so Yeah, our, uh, go ahead. No, go, go ahead. I was going to say our, our background um, you know, from Spaceworks, Spaceworks uh, does a lot of conceptual design, and we've been working hypersonic systems uh, for uh, you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, and it's, it's, you know, being able to actually be a part of building uh, vehicles and flying them um, that are uh, actually going to make these types of future vehicles that we've, we've had on our walls for years uh, a reality is, is really, really exciting. Uh, where can people go for more information on what you guys are doing? Uh, sure. So you can check out our website at generationorbit.com. Um, our Twitter feed is uh, usually a little bit more uh, up to date than our website. Um, so you can find us at Generation Orbit. Um, and if you, uh, if you ever have any questions or want to ask questions about what we do or come see us in Atlanta, uh, just feel free to send an email to info at generationorbit.com. That's pretty awesome stuff. Thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday to come on the show. Uh, it's going to be fun to kind of watch the progress of Go On and then up to Go Next and uh, see how things uh, are going for you. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Ben. It's been a pleasure. All right. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back to Tomorrow. Now, before we get into comments from last week's show, I do want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. We've also got our Tomorrow producers. They're people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And we've got our Tomorrow 
uh, premier, Patreon Plus subscribers. I Easy for me to say. These are people who contributed $2.50 or more to this specific episode. Now, from this level and above, you're going to get access to After Dark immediately. You also get a bunch of other perks as you can do each individual level. But there is one more level that gets your name in the show, and that's our patron level. That's anywhere between one penny, maybe, uh, and $2.49. Now, I'm hearing that Patreon no longer allows you to contribute one penny to a show. So uh, I don't know what the new minimums are. I'll work on figuring that out. Uh, but somewhere between one penny and $2.49 is what everyone here did. If you'd like more information on our different reward levels and our goals and what we're trying to do, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. I hope everyone enjoyed that interview last segment. I thought it was really good. Uh, you know, we were talking during the break. They just kind of, you know, Generation Orb, but I hadn't even really heard of them before. Mm -hmm. And uh, like out of nowhere, you know, they're already doing captive carry tests. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I really want to call it a test. That's not really fair. But right. Captive yeah. carry experiments, which is pretty cool. So they're actually doing something. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they've got their Go One that is pretty far along, it sounds like, right? 2018 yeah. is not that far away. Right. Uh, and they're very down to earth. And I thought it was interesting that, you know, the chat room's asking these questions, boom, 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 rapid fire. And AJ was able to answer them seamlessly, easily. I mean, they really had their ducks in a row. So. Yeah. That was pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, Capcom, get us started with some comments from last week's show. All right, so uh, we were talking about capsule or space plane last week. It was Caps kind of the... Capsule or space plane. And I, I don't know if that's <laughs> Anyway, uh, first comment comes <laughs> off of Patreon from Jason Hammond. And yes, I almost said John Hammond. I apologize. The <laughs> space-worthy passenger vehicle has to operate in three different environments. The risk management regime of launch, the nuance of orbital operations, and the toasty descent. Safety? Comfort, affordability, pick two. <laughs> no, no, because I go to the Peter, Peter Diamandis school of thinking. Yes, which, which is? What, Amanda's production. Peter Diamandis production, which is when given multiple options, choose them all. So I choose them all. <laughs> I, you know, I don't, I don't think that it has to be done that. I, Maybe at first it has to be like that. Maybe at first it does, but I feel like there's a way to engineer around that. Right, and you can, with enough time, you can get that. Well, hang on, Soyuz has been flying for how many years now and it still doesn't have any comfort? Yeah, well, I mean. Wait, 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 at this point, for it doesn't also doesn't have affordability either. Well, yeah, that's true. Let's be fair. <laughs> <laughs> but it does have safety. Yay! <laughs> Where did my other two go? <laughs> Yeah, so pick any one, I guess, is what I should have said. Yeah, but I mean, that's, one example does not make an entire yeah. case there, right? So. Uh, one could argue for the space shuttle. Actually, right now, space travel is not comfortable, and that's why, while I want to go to Mars, I will not be the first one on Mars. I'm going to wait for Dave Mastin to build the indoor plumbing for me. He's going to make that plumbing for me. Once he has the plumbing done... He's I mean, a hiker camper. He's not going to build indoor plumbing for you. He'll build indoor plumbing for me. <laughs> he will. He we've loves got, you, just we've not got, that much. We've got Dave coming on the show in uh, late October. I'm going to ask him if he will build indoor... Like, if he'll add that into his business plan, build indoor plumbing on Mars for Ben. I want to be on camera when I say, I bet you... Yeah. His reaction, his initial reaction is uh -huh. going to be... <laughs> that's his reaction. No, I'm not. And that's it. That. And he's that's not gonna. No, because he's not. Anyway, <laughs> next comment. <laughs> uh, comes off of YouTube. This one comes from Median. Or I'm sorry, Gideon Neb Nebelsick. Neb Nebelsick. 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 Uh, says my problem with space planes is that as far as I'm aware, none of them have a pad abort capability to survive an Amos six type pad explosion, and also they do not have the capability to survive a space transport system 51L type failure, and additionally, at any point, first and second stage burn during the launch from Cape Canaveral, the space plane would have to be capable of RTLS, which is return to launch site, TAL or slash A. Oh, a transatlantic landing. Uh, abort. Uh, abort. Abort, uh, abort once around and abort to orbit. Yeah, an abort, abort to orbit. once around. That's what it, I've never heard that one. Or an ATO, which is abort to orbit. Right? Yep, you got it. You yes! Got it. In case of engine failure or performance loss to save the crew since it cannot ditch. That would be true of the space transportation sh system, which is uh, traditionally known as the space shuttle from NASA. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you would need those different abort modes because of how it was designed. I do not believe you would need all of those abort modes on any space plane, though. That space plane that you're on would need to be able to safely abort back 
at any point in traject any point in. So either you need to abort back to Earth or abort to orbit, essentially, be able to get up into space far enough where you can do something. I don't think you actually need all of those different abort modes of a traditional uh, space plane because you don't have to make the same compromises that the space shuttle made. But so what Gideon is saying, that, like, the difference between the problem that he has, presumably with a space plane versus a, a, a capsule, is that he hated shuttle. Is that what I'm hearing? He did everything he, about and, and the main thing is that the, the argument of capsules versus space planes is that space planes don't have as many abort capabilities and don't have as many safety features to escape from some sort of accident. Okay. And one thing that I will say in defense of at least a particular space plane, the Dream, Dream Chaser, Chaser. Is, is that for the, the, the commercial crew requirements, they need to be able to have abort capabilities during all of the sections of launch. And for the crew type version, the cargo type version would be encapsulated within a payload, but the crew type version of their Dream Chaser Chaser would sit on top of the Semtar upper stage and actually has engines built into the space plane itself. And if needed, those would normally be used for all the rendezvous maneuvers that they would do to get to the International Space Station. But if needed, they would use the fuel uh, with those built-in motors on the Dream Chaser to have a pusher escape system and escape away from the rocket if anything went wrong during launch. So, Which is how uh, it would be able to survive an Amos 6 type uh, uh, anomaly on the pad. Hmm. Right, because mm -hmm. it's using those pushers just like you would see a dragon, a, a crew dragon vehicle, and, and I'm totally with you there, Space Mike. I think Dream Chaser yeah. is an awesome vehicle because it has those abort modes. It's not a side-mounted design; it's a top-mounted design. Right, it's on top of the rocket. It can light those engines, and uh, I don't think that you need to be able to do like what you just need to be able to come back safely. Ultimately, is what it comes down yeah. to. Yeah. Right. So you need to be able to survive. Uh, you need to be able to survive. That's it. That, that's what. That's ultimately what it comes down to. And you can build a space plane with the capability to survive. You don't have to have all these different types of abort modes because that's what NASA did, right? You just need to figure out how to survive all these different scenarios. Yeah. Oh, if anyone was wondering what uh, STS-51L, what mission that was, that was the Challenger um, incident where we lost some astronauts there. So that's what Gideon was referring to. But uh, in Space Mike, if that were Dream Chaser instead of Shuttle, they would have been just fine. Right? Did we lose Space Mike? He's he's super like frozen. Space Mike oh, wow. is frozen. It's kind of We're, creepy actually. Really, he's like staring really into my soul. Oh. oh no, we lost the Space Mike. Wow, uh, we, we we've got a lug. But up. we gained a mini story. To answer for Space Mike, my <laughs> own question, uh, yeah, it would have been just fine. Why don't uh, you just answer it the way Mike would have answered it? I don't think I have that much excitement in me, though. All right, slacker. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> the, ne the next comment comes off of YouTube from Matichus. Hey, guys. About alternative alternatives to space planes slash capsules to get off the surface and up to orbital attitude and speed, how about the airship to orbit idea, JP Aerospace? Is there any chance their idea could work? A regular airship to high altitude balloon castle where cargo people are transferred to a high altitude to orbit airship using solar cells and ion thrusters. Really slow, but very energy efficient and potentially low cost to mass. Space Mike, you interviewed John Powell two years ago or so. Have you had any progress since then? Yeah, Space Mike. Yeah, Space Mike. Let's go to Space, Space Mike. Mike on that one. Let's go to Space Mike. Uh, no Space Mike. <laughs> <laughs> He's just a. He's just a. Just a logo a right now. Logo right now. That's so sad. It is very sad. Um, actually, I'm not familiar with that plan at all. Are you? Either? I'm not either. But I think even if you did use a like say a high altitude balloon to get yourself up, you, you're you're getting altitude. But the whole point of getting to orbit is you need to go really really fast sideways. So, I mean, it's it that's might the help thing you a that people bit. seem to forget. Yeah. Like you think you're going high, and you are, but you're actually going fast. Yeah. Uh, ultimately, more than anything else, you're going fast, not high. Yeah. So I don't know if that idea would... I'm not familiar with the idea, but... It sounds cool, yeah, though. It does sound Rega cool. Regardless of that, I want to go on that trip. Yeah. I just want to... I want to go... I want to go on a airship. Just in general, that would be awesome. Yeah. Uh, I want to take that up to a floating balloon castle. Yeah. Yeah. Also oh, awesome, know. by the way. Yeah. That would, I want to take an airship to a balloon castle. I, when someone says, hey, what are you doing this weekend? I want to say, I'm going to go on an airship and get off in a balloon castle. That's something I want to do. I'm not, I would love to, now I think I have a company idea. I think this would be, even if you're not going to space. The balloon castle of tomorrow. The balloon castle of tomorrow. could be a tomorrow. new Patreon post. I, I wonder, do you, do you <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. At $1,000 per episode. No, it'd be more than that, I bet. Um, 
Do, do you paint it to look like a like a castle castle though? Oh, you know what's funny? Uh, so jpaerospace.com, yeah. uh, they have a PDF description of their program that they have called ATO. Abort to orbit? Airship to orbit. Airship to orbit. They are, they are reclaiming. That, ATO. Yep. Mm. That three letter acronym. Mm -mm. They're that, reclaiming. That's probably not a good idea. JP Aerospace, uh, I'm hereby requesting that you change that. <laughs> dear JP Aerospace, <laughs> please don't use ATO. Oh, that's not a good idea. Please. It sounds please, really terrible. The community of tomorrow asks you, try something else. Thank you. But, but airship to orbit. Yeah. I love the I love the idea. I think yeah, that'd be totally yeah. fun, they especially just, if they get the pricing right, right. So right. if they're not charging me ten million dollars to do this, if it if if it's if it, it has to be ten thousand dollars or less, ten thousand dollars or less mm -hmm. for me to get on an airship and go to an, an air air ca a balloon castle, yeah. balloon a castle. balloon castle. Yeah. I'm doing this. This sounds amazing. So A T B C, right? No, that's not good either. Yeah. All right. air, <laughs> airship to balloon castle. <laughs> airship. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Why not? Fine. Uh, how about just Project Balloon Castle? <laughs> That's cool. That's cool. I like right? that. Yeah, Project oh, Balloon yeah. Castle. Goodness. Uh, all right, next up. All right. So I'm stuck on this Balloon <laughs> Castle. I just think that's awesome. All right. Well, mental note, Ben's birthday is January 30th. I want a Balloon Castle. Community. That's what I just heard. So, uh, next one comes off of YouTube from Tom Ross. Space plane versus space capsule? Shuttle is no longer flying, and Soyuz is flying. Capsules are the way to go. The cost of operating a space plane is not worth its special capabilities. Sierra Nevada is learning this as we speak. Ah, ooh, but I like Ouch. the Dream Chaser. Yeah. That's like the one exception Sick to bird, space planes man. I Sick have. Sick bird, man. Sick bird. Yeah, I know. Like, I mean, generally, I'm like, yeah, space planes are terrible, except for Dream Chaser. Well, because it's all engineering trades, right? And right. They, I think they made really great trades with the Dream Chaser. Yeah. Um, there are cons to capsules as well, but generally speaking, yeah, it's, it, you get better engineering trades with capsules than you do with space planes. Just, just broad strokes so that you're just going to. Um, but yeah. But I don't know. That, I'm not sure that's fair to Sierra Nevada. Sierra Nevada, uh, I think, um, ultimately they lost out on the, um, the what, what contract was it? The crew? Commercial crew. Commercial crew contract to NASA. If they had that, mm -hmm. they'd be in a very different place now. Yeah. yeah. Right? I mean, and I'm really sad that they lost that I particular contract. I was super sad when right? I felt like, whatever, I'm not going to comment there. But uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if they had that contract, I think they'd be in a really different place. Yeah. I think it's actually a fantastic idea. And, and they're really far along. And by the way, they lost the can contract. That didn't stop them. Some other companies would be like, oh, we're out. We're not going to do anything anymore. They didn't. Sierra Nevada was like, all right, fine, let's pivot and refocus and turn it into cargo. There's, there's a market for this thing. And so they're still continuing to build it under their own money. It's, it, go Sierra Nevada. Go Dream Chaser. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> rah, rah. Oh, Trebles, thank you for that. Anyway, so. Uh, what did next, Trebles say? No, it's a link. Next comment comes off of YouTube. This one comes from Kim Boder Bondergard. Bundergard. Bundergard? Bundergard? Bondergard. Yeah. Hi, Kim. Hi, Kim. Uh, I'd like to see another segment, maybe fitted in after Space News, where a more focused argument is done like solid versus liquid engines and pros and cons about those. I like the topics you have, but more focused on the arguments. Love the discussions you guys have with such a passion. I, I, I understand the idea. It's just we're not focused. Well, that's Space Pods. <laughs> Right? Yeah, that is space, space pods. pods. Ultimately, that's what space pods are yeah, for. Yeah, exactly. High, five minute or less focused topics on things. Yeah. Although he's saying he wants um, he wants an argument. Sure. All right, yeah. solid versus liquid. You're although, wrong. <laughs> although uh, <laughs> you're, I'm right. Jared, I'm pointing off camera. You can't see me. Yep. But Jared, you're all about liquid and not solid. Yeah. And you. Well, they both have their benefits depending on where they're going to be exactly. used. Exactly. And you. I don't care. They all look the same. Uh, oh. <laughs> yes. Uh, 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 uh. My director's laughing. I know you guys can't hear it, but Dutta is totally laughing, and that was worth it just for that. The entire space community collectively sighed at yep. that. Uh, yeah, so you and I <laughs> need to be on camera sometime to have yeah. a debate. Although yes. I feel like we did that. Did we do, did we do that in After Dark, though? <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Yeah, we need to have like a... We need to come and bring oh. facts. Is yeah, what that, Dutta that is said, do it yes. again and come and bring facts because both of us were just like, this is my opinion, and that's what happened. And yeah. we didn't have like a list of like It'll these. Be good. Yeah, like. It'll how, be really good. Yeah, no, I think slaughter. that's a good idea. I think there yeah, are. Yeah, I would slaughter you. I think there are uh, some arguments 
that we, we could have on the show, for sure. Yeah. All right. As opposed to a round table yeah. discussion. We've well, Moonfest and Mars. Yeah, uh, how about, oh, Space Mike! There he is. Space Welcome Mike. back. About that. Space Mike, Woo. you know oh, you missed. You missed. Yes, and you also missed the, uh, what is it? There the, was a comment just for him. It was. Yeah. It, it's the. Space Mike, you interviewed John Powell about two years ago or so ago. Have you had any I progress did. since then? Have they had any progress since then? Uh, yes, they have. I mean, they, they launch uh, what they call their uh, uh, Pong Sats all the time, which is great because they do it for free. And they mostly encourage like uh, elementary school students and stuff like that to submit whatever uh, payload they're going to have. I mean, it's really cute. Some kids, he said, like submit, you know, they'll like have some candy or like their favorite like little toy that can fit inside of this little ping pong ball. And some of them they've been blown away with that actually have like a full blown experiment and have like really teeny tiny solar panels coming out of the outside and little sensors and I mean it's still just a really basic thing just being you know lifted up in the atmosphere with the helium balloons but still you know they were very impressed that they've gotten you know ac you know actual like scientific experiments from elementary school students and they do these pongs packs experiments every year they uh, have definitely had a lot of commercial success in uh, the past couple of years uh, putting up uh, uh, certain payloads for uh, companies to advertise, to have their advertisements with their, uh, uh, whatever their product is floating in space. And uh, they've done certain things for uh, different movies, for Hollywood. There's some uh, uh, JP Aerospace footage that you've seen in some movies that you might not have realized was JP Aerospace footage, but it was. I can't think of the movies off the top of my head, but um, they are, I, I know that their big ambitious plan was to create essentially a giant V-wing uh, blimp for lack of a better word, that would be able to go much higher into the stratosphere, being built out of a little bit better material than the normal balloons that they uh, fill helium up with. And from there, they might even be able to do like some really uh, ambitious uh, uh, raccoon balloon launch type of things, but even higher up and having less uh, delta V requirements. Although you have the whole velocity argument, which our, our guest on today's show uh, uh, presented really well. So you know, there's con plus cons and, and pros to both of that. And I do know that JP Aerospace had a test flight of that of that V-wing uh, they uh, were building, but uh, um, other than that, I don't know about any other major progress or if they have begun any work with any sort of raccoon experiments launching a rocket off of one of their platforms. But most of the work that I've uh, been aware of is their uh, commercial work that they've been doing, which I'm sure is going to help fund a lot of their ambitious plans. Space Mike, this is the most important question I think I've ever asked you. Do they have a balloon castle? <laughs> <laughs> a balloon castle in have the sky? Have they built a balloon castle yet? That's what we're looking for here. <laughs> well, if they have, I'm sure they haven't told any of us. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. <laughs> After watching this show, they're like, no, never let them on our balloons. <laughs> they can't get on the airship and they're not allowed entry into the balloon castle. Uh, I, seriously, though, I want that balloon castle. All right, everyone, thank you so much for watching. That is our show for this week. Thank, you, thank everyone so much for watching. Uh, next week, I believe we have uh, Swiss Space Systems on the show. Uh, that's going to prove to be a very interesting segment. So uh, thank you very much, and we'll see you next week.